Well, really what we're doing now is just, just so that we, uh, you know, just so we get to cut to the chase. What we're going to do is quickly introduce the next phase of our uh, project, which is the second phase, which is inequality. We finished the death of nature. And, and so that's where we're, uh, uh, we're just going to basically run over what we've done. Karthi, did you get it yet? Not yet. Okay. So Karthi is going to share my slides, which I somehow could not get into this thing. And uh, what we'll do is just walk through what we've done so far and then talk about the next thing. And I have a friend of mine saying, tried multiple times and can't get it. Sorry, dude. Okay. Jamshade, that's you. Here we are. Um, oh, yes. So what we're talking about today is really the, the idea of inequality in all its guises so we're in, in, in all its forms. So if you go to the next slide, Karthi, we'll just launch into this is sort of what we're going to do today. We're going to go real quick through sort of the many phases and types of inequality. And then we're going to have Karthi and Arissa present uh, some work that they've done on gender inequality and its intersection with climate change, which I think is uh, very important because it shows how sort of two of these wicked problems impinge and actually interact with each other, uh, which is kind of what this project's about, is to show how all these wicked uh, problems are interrelated. Next, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so... This is how we started, is by saying there's an ecosystem of wicked problems where all these problems are interconnected. And this is very important because as we'll see, go ahead, next slide. Um, this is what we showed up with. with the, we, we just finished our first, in April, we did the first part of our challenge, which is death of nature. And we had a bunch of uh, people who submitted, part of our working group people, we worked uh, very diligently have thousands read, went through thousands of articles and hundreds of reports to produce these diagrams, Phil, that actually interconnect and show sort of uh, how these problems are interconnected. Our next step with all these diagrams is to put them all together and kind of normalize them so we have one big chart, uh, which is the death of nature. The next slide. What we're talking about now is inequality and the types of inequality. Is there any way to make that screen bigger so that the thing fits like the whole screen or something for well, so I can see the slides a little better? I'm just trying to see if I can do that. Uh, settings, not really. Okay. Um, so we have next slide. Just Let's just go to the next slide. I wanted to say something uh, for a minute about Mr. Peanut. Mr. Peanut... You know, as you as as you guys know, as a popular icon in our culture, the guy, you know, the peanut with the top hat and the monocle. Uh, uh, but that caricature is actually a very serious character. He represents the capitalist elite uh, sort of aristocrat who's taken over the business uh, uh, sort of elite who have taken over sort of uh, the world. And, and I want you to, to introduce you to Clark Fox, who's an artist who's painted Mr. Peanut. And, and by the way, his works in the Smithsonian and everything else. So he's a very famous painter, but his idea is that Mr. Peanut is not an innocent guy. He's actually, uh, you know, the guy who's basically running the world. And, and so Mr. Peanut is, is sort of emblematic or an icon for inequality. And, and that's why you'll see me uh, bringing up uh, Clark Fox's peanut time and time again. And Clark Fox himself is a Native American painter. So his, all his paintings uh, have some kind of uh, underlayer of inequality and, and the discrimination and, and the problems that Native Americans have faced in this country. So next slide, please. So he, uh, here's Mr. Peanut again, but now we'll talk about the types of inequality. We have income inequality, gender inequality, race inequality, racism, religious or ideological inequality, where people are sort of discriminated against because of religion, class-based, which is based on class, I guess, which is kind of wealth or aristocracy kind of thing, nationality, sexual orientation, our capabilities, 
uh, let's say we're differently abled or maybe we have a mental uh, uh, problem or, and so we're discriminated based on that and then of course age and there's other kinds so if you guys have more let us know and, and work uh, you know we, we'd like to really explore all these forms of inequality next slide uh, one of the things that's happened with COVID, which, you know, we were talking about the base of the pyramid, Phil, which is the old model that, you know, there's a there's a layer of people at the bottom of the pyramid who, you know, we don't actually do anything for. We don't actually design our products for and we don't actually work with them. Uh, and businesses don't. And COVID has changed the shape of that pyramid to look more like this new pyramid that I'm showing you here, which is, you, know, you have a very thin sliver that's the top of the pyramid and then everybody else is concentrated on the bottom and that's sort of a more realistic base of the pyramid today next slide please so one of the things that i was looking at is how does inequality express itself and so there's this guy ferdinand mount who's actually done a lot of research in this area he says these are the areas in terms of politics in other words, are your politicians even listening to you? Are you even are you even on the political landscape? And so, if you're not even on the radar, if they don't even listen to you, then you then you're being you, not just unequal, unequal. You're just absent. Uh, then you have equality of opportunity, equality of outcomes, equality of treatment, and equality of membership. Are you a member of society, or are you just disparaged and put up to the sidelines? So. As we work on this, we're going to look at this Ferdinand Mount and his work because I think it's very important because he shows how each form that we talked about earlier, ageism, sexism, uh, racism, all of them are expressed in these uh, same, in these five or six, uh, five of them there are here, right? Yeah, in these five expressions of inequality in society. Uh, next slide, please. And, and then we're going to combine it with where does this impact us as an individual in our community that we live in, uh, at work? So at work, for example, we can look at income inequality, you know, the wide gap between the CEO and the average worker. We can look at gender inequality at work, the wide gap between, let's say, women and, and what they're getting paid at work and, and let's say the responsibilities that they have and the number of women in management, the number of women in the executive suite and compare that to the, uh, the ratio of women to men in the, uh, in the population. And if there's a huge disparity, obviously there's an issue. Same thing with uh, your region. You know, there could be different states and different regions that have very different uh, wealth uh, bases and power. So California, for example, versus Alabama, there's a huge inequality between these two states. And one way we try to fix that is, is actually by having federal taxes that come from California go to people in Alabama. That, why are we doing that? Because we want Alabama to have some of the same uh, rights and, and, and sort of opportunities uh, that California has. And so in a sense, that is the idea of the common good, Phil. And then of course, nationally, at a national level, we have inequality uh, where you have, let's say the G7 and the G20 the most powerful countries in the world that are lording it over everybody else. And so we've got to find some way that our voices from countries that aren't as powerful or as equal, let's say, as some of these uh, bigger powers, how do they relate? And COVID, in a sense, has broken all these boundaries wide open because right now we have countries like India uh, that don't even have vaccines, don't even have enough vaccines, whereas the U.S. has some 500 million extra vaccines sitting in storage. And we have what's called vaccine nationalism happening, where people don't want to share vaccines. So we've got to find some way to bridge these boundaries and work together, or we're going to fall apart. And that's part of what this project is trying to do is, go ahead, next slide. Basically, if you haven't been listening or you missed our first uh, uh, webinar, which was maybe a slightly more organized than this one, uh, <laughs> you'd see, you'd, you'd know that we actually have a process for trying to map out these wicked problems. The first step that we're doing in this project is mapping these wicked problems out. Next slide. 
and 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 part of this is also the fact that we want to depoliticize the decision making and the discussion of these things because far too often when you start quoting facts and figures you, people will say well that's not true it's fake news or or you bring your ideology to the game and what we're and what and what we've stressed from the very beginning is that we want this ideology and and this baggage that we have to keep it at the, at the uh, outside the room and let's look at the truth let's really try to understand what is actually happening so that's part of our mission for this project is to not get caught in the politics but try to focus on what's actually happening next slide please so for income inequality these are three big questions why is it happening why is nothing changing and what happens next if we do nothing and and go ahead to the next slide and i think this is our last slide uh you know the rich get richer the poor get poorer so i started doing this little chart just as a fun example of how the rich do get richer and what are the effects and ca uh, causes of that one of them is of course inherited wealth if you're very rich to begin with if you're born rich then it becomes easier for you to become even more rich so you have wealth held in families that you know that gets in it's called intergenerational wealth and that kind of wealth is sort of where a vast majority of wealth in this world lives in another kind of wealth of course is executive pay which has skyrocketed as you can see in this little chart over the last so we're going to dig much deeper into these topics I just wanted to show you sort of how we're going to start looking at these things and nothing's off the table because we want to really look at income inequality. So Phil, with that, I want to say we're going to have Carthy and Arissa present a short little thing on their findings on the intersection between gender inequality and climate change. Right. Go guys. Thanks. Christian. Hi, Arisa. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, David. <laughs> okay, so we're going to just share our screen and then... Uh, hello, gonna... everyone. Hi. Hi, David. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Um, not yet. Yeah. Yes? Um, for me, not yet. Not yet. Yet. Now? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Awesome. Okay. So, as part of the um, Wicked Challenge 1, um, you know, the effects of climate change, Arisa and I sort of realized that there was a major impact on gender inequality. And these are some of the findings that we had. Orisa and I. Um, so this is the cause and effect map that we uh, worked on for gender inequality in relation to the death of nature. And as you can see, um, the death of nature, what it does is uh, when you have a wicked problem like climate change, it, it sort of almost, um, um, you know, has a domino effect on a gender inequality. So when there's more climate change, and Arisa, feel free to jump in like at any time if I'm saying something stupid, okay? Um, uh, so when there's climate change, there's, there's climate migration and displacement, which leads to homelessness, which leads to gender-based violence, which in turn leads to, you know, genital mutilation, etc. And from there, it also leads to high chance of infectious disease, high mortality rates, and, you know, the rising sea levels, for example, cause, you know, problems for women to access clean water, uh, which causes sanitation issues. Uh, access to clean water is interrelated with food production issues and food security. And also, you know, um, children being born with, uh, you know, birth defects who are undernourished and which then leads to female infanticide. On the other hand, the food insecurity also leads to malnutrition, which leads to higher mortality rates, which again becomes harder because, as you can see, it's all so viciously connected because, mm -hmm. I mean, for us, and what we realized, Arissa and I, is some of these problems 
don't seem very familiar to us because we live in cities but um you know uh, as you uh, w- what we don't realize is that most of the women who live uh, you know below the poverty line are facing and will continue to face all of these issues and it'll only get worse because you can see the statistic here 80% of people displaced by climate change are women that's 80% and even though women dominate the food production in the world we own less than 20% of the land so what we really want to say here is today as it stands what arisa and i found out is that all of the gender inequality problems are compounded when there is climate change on top of it arisa do you want to sort of talk through a little bit about uh what we learned in terms of statistics yeah. definitely i think the biggest takeaway we learned from our research was that even though climate change is generally seen it's a problem that endangers all of us it negatively impacts the people like dis- disproportionately impacts the people who are the most vulnerable which are women and for example like out of 1.3 billion people living in poverty 70% are women like Karthi said earlier even though we predominate the food production in the world we own less than 20% of the land 2/3 of the world's 74 744 million Ill- illiterate adults are women and actually impacts of this and because like of rigid gender roles in certain countries these leave women to suffer the most during times of climate events for instance during the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami three times as many women died than men because in the region men were more likely to learn how to be able to swim and during like times of crisis especially now with covid going on uh this is especially highlighted with the un reporting that covid-19 has set back gender equality by 25 years and this kind of like highlights the importance of gender equality which is in the next slide because not only is it important in terms of the future of our society but even in terms of the way countries can adapt to climate change women play a very vital and essential role studies have shown that investing in universal education and family planning in low and middle income countries could reduce emissions by 85.42 gigatons by 2050 and just one year of secondary education for a young girl can equate to a wage increase of 25% later in life. And especially like I said during the times of the pandemic, uh outcomes related to COVID-19 including the number of cases and deaths were systematically better in countries led by women. So basically what we're trying to say is through all of the research and findings that we did, we learned that women are an underutilized and very underappreciated resource that when given equal opportunity could lead the world towards a more sustainable and hopeful future. And this is why essentially in our next slide as well we really wanted to highlight how these women are leading the charge in our planet and like saving it and inspiring us all to do better and to do our part. Thanks Arisa. We just wanted to highlight a few activists in different ways how women are making a difference from whether it's like a teenager like Greta Thunberg or whether it's Rachel Karen or even Dr Jane Goodall um you know from different parts of the world from India from Africa with even if it's somebody like Sylvia Earle who's working with the uh, you know health of the oceans how women are making a difference and the point that Arisa and I really want to make is uh it doesn't matter what kind of feminist you are or what kind of equality that you're advocating for ultimately we are all eco feminists because no matter which one of these things we are advocating for or fighting to make better and equal for genders ultimately we're helping solve the larger problem which is uh climate change because all of these things are interconnected arisa yes basically when climate change get work gets worse it affects the women and the most vulnerable and 
by combating all of this together, we not only help solve one issue, but we're able to solve multiple. So that's our chart. Thanks a lot, you guys. That was really good. So let's start by asking some questions. Phil, you got any questions? Uh, no, I'm just absorbing it and impressed with the findings. Um, yeah. Good stuff. Now, I'll tell you a little secret here. David here at the bottom of our screen has been a UN guy running around all over Africa, really trying to learn about some of these issues on the ground. David, you have any perspectives for us? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Actually, um, I used to work in Rwanda. Um, it was 2010 to 2011. Yeah, it's... It, I think the finding is really uh, good because that's really exactly what I saw. Um, in many cases, actually, the, as you, as uh, Karthi and uh, Arisa pointed out, the most the most vulnerable actually are the hit hard. Uh, when I was there, I remember that the children and women actually are always vulnerable whenever there is a problem, and I have seen so many cases that children had to die only because the clinics are not around. They had a small stomach ache, just and then they have to walk like a few hours to get to the clinic. It just happened so many times. I actually I remember that I broke down and shed tears so many times. So that's why we also started building the clinics. But started building the clinics is not a problem because people who can work there, like medical people or nurses, actually a shortage. So um, it was didn't work very well. Uh, but it's not confined to. I think Rwanda, of course, uh, is actually is, uh, relevant to all many uh, company uh, countries that developing countries, uh, less developed, and they are always the problems that people are uh, hit hard whenever uh, there's a feminine or when there's a digesters hit. Actually, this COVID nineteen just uh, exactly the same situation, I think. Are there, are there any questions in the audience? On, on YouTube, I guess we lost some people on YouTube. Well, I have a question for, for you, Arissa and Karthi. In terms of COVID, you know, and this is maybe a question for everybody, in terms of COVID, what can be done now in a place like India? What do you, what do you think are some of the first things, David, you too, I mean, we're having a crisis at the point where the hospitals don't have oxygen, although they say they do. People are literally dying, waiting in the uh, in line, and and we're having a hard time just disposing and cremating the bodies. On top of that, there still is not a complete lockdown. I I, I don't believe across the country, and I, I believe now the army is going to come in and create these giant hospital things at the last minute. But the question, I guess, is, and this is nothing to do with politics, even though people could say it's political. The question is, why is the is a government so unresponsive or not paying attention to the crisis until it becomes sort of, you know, sort of a collapse type situation? Any, any suggestions or ideas on, on what has to be done? Karthi or David or Phil <laughs> or Arissa. Um, Phil, do you want to sort of say something? So I'll tell you another story. Phil, actually, when he was doing his PhD work, went to India for a year. Is that correct, Phil? As, as, as he correct. was trying to, what, what, were you, what was your thesis that you were trying to prove that didn't work? Oh, that has to do with whether you pay wait, higher wages, will it lead to more productivity? And uh, unfortunately, I had uh, the evidence show that it was not leading to higher productivity. So that justified the management not to pay more. It's not, not really good. a justification, but uh, but by the way, that was a different India at the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, uh, it doesn't help us understand what they should do now. The biggest appointment is Modi, who um, 
normally was a hero uh, at the start. He kick-started the economy. Where is he now? I just don't know. But I do know that public opinion is down on him very much. But um, the thing is uh, that is strange is that India is very good at making uh, vaccines. And there shouldn't be a shortage in India. I can't understand why. Uh, and they have all the ingredients. I mean, those. I hope that the, the pharmaceutical companies in India are not holding back because there are better profits not to put money into helping save lives. Actually, Phil, there was an article or two that came out uh, recently in the last week that basically said some of the holdups in the vaccine production were based on the United States not releasing some of the raw ingredients that they needed to make the vaccines. So there was some finger pointing so back and forth. Yeah. Was it the U.S. or was it the big companies like uh, that were holding back? I think it was the U.S. that had banned the export of certain uh, Well, maybe because they were feeling that there would be a shortage in the United States. Yes, it's not yes. something we were happy about. Right. But um, that's, a, that's very shameful. Yeah, so that, that is what was happening. And then the latest story, just so you know, with the vaccines, the guy who's been producing the AstraZeneca things at the Serum Institute in, in Pune, he actually had to flee the country, Phil, because he was getting threatening phone calls from all these different uh, political people, uh, chief ministers from different states, who are on, uh, literally, this is an interview that he did where he said that initially they were very nice to him on the phone, but when he told them he didn't have extra vaccines to ship to them or their state, then they started threatening him, so much so that he ended up actually getting on one of the last planes to the UK and flying mm -hmm. out of the country uh, almost in fear of his life. Yes. And yes. not only that, but he has now suggested that he is going to open a couple of factories out uh, to produce the vaccine outside of India so he doesn't have these kinds of uh, uh, sort of undue pressures uh, you mm -hmm. know, put on him or his executive team. Uh, because, of course, it's a situation of desperation. But what happens in a society when, uh, you know, the rules aren't being followed anymore, it becomes a society of, uh, you know, threats of violence and that kind of thing. And I think we see that almost everywhere when, when things collapse. And in a sense, you could say that COVID is sort of the, the dress rehearsal for the much worse things that are to come if we don't get... Uh, our act together and learn to work together. Uh, one article I read uh, yesterday or day before from Umer Huck, uh, Karthi, you know this one. Basically, he said one of the interesting things was, was that uh, the vaccine itself, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine was created in, in, a, in a research institute, right, at, at, at Oxford which was a public sort of thing. It didn't have a patent or anything. But then instead of licensing that patent to the world, to the world and saying, hey, here, here it is, open source, everybody go start producing it. What they did is they licensed it to AstraZeneca, who then said, well, we're going to produce it in the Serum Institute in India under license. And then when other countries were asking for, is it possible uh, to give us the formula so we can, because it's a crisis, give us this formula so we can make this vaccine ourselves as well in our country. Of course, uh, you know, the IP laws kicked in and all of a sudden we, we were saying, no, uh, you can't use these uh, uh, formulas for the vaccines. We're not going to give them to anybody else. Yeah. No. Oh, nice question from Jumpshade. Yeah. So we have a question coming in from Jamshed. Uh, what can be done to release the vaccines that the U.S. is hoarding at this time when they're clearly not needed? Anybody? David, you're the, you're the public policy guy. D David went to the Kennedy School so he could study public policy and stuff. So we're going we're gonna to lean on him. Are we, are we sure that... Uh things are not being released now. 
you're trying to answer whether uh, what can we do to get them to release and i i i would be puzzled that they aren't now trying to we're sending a lot of a lot of things to india as much as i think we can yeah unless the republicans are are stopping it no i i do th i think th even biden was initially holding back on some of this stuff but i do yeah, believe in the, in, in the last few days we've seen a a, a huge uh I think a pledge of a hundred million dollars to to India to help uh, you know set up some stuff, but again the question is how fast can this thing be handled and how is it going to be distributed? Because Delhi and these big cities are of course uh, you know the giant centers of population, but apparently this time the virus has spread throughout the country as well, so that it's affecting mm -hmm. rural areas at a much higher rate than it did last time, and of course. As David was telling us about the clinics in Rwanda, it's sort of the same problem. In, in the rural clinics, they don't have enough staff, they don't have the machines, they don't have you know hardly anything. They don't even have testing going on properly. In fact, uh, some of the testing centers were shut down in rural areas after the first wave. So we have a, a you know a, really a crisis of you know several layers of crisis, one on top of the other. And not to mention the fact that India itself doesn't have a, a, a strong public health infrastructure. And, and so we have, we, I mean, basically this is a, a time for India to re-examine how that society has been set up. And as somebody who grew up in India, I can say that it has not been one that was based on equality and one that's based on the common good. It's really been... Uh, Population is one of the problems, but corruption is another. Uh, the fact that, you know, uh, we haven't sort of built a system that works for more than just the wealthy. Mm. Uh, it works really well if you have money. And, and now even the wealthy are finding that there are limits to their money because of the, the level of the crisis. The, 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 there's so many people uh, that the, even the hospitals aren't going to take, uh, take you anymore. Uh, I remember it's just not enough room. Yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, Christian, I remember that, uh, I mean, before we jump into the fact that whether it's really is true or not, whether the United States actually holding the vaccine materials or not, I, I wouldn't even go that far. I would like to focus on more on that because this kind of, uh, just a, like a currency and then Arisa pointed out very well, uh, when you see the India, when we talked about the social distancing, for example, whether it's really going to work or not, because uh, there are certain places where people are supposed to live together. They don't have any uh, privacy. They, they, have to, they are supposed to share the toilets, uh, bathrooms and everything. So it was already uh, when we had this uh, COVID-19 starting in 2020, there was a news article and there was the video, newspaper, news uh, broadcasting also about how Indians especially those people who are vulnerable, can practice the social distancing because it's not going to work. It's impossible because they share everything. And then uh, actually it was kind of predictable that what is happening now. So I th what I'm trying to say is that it's very complicated issue that we cannot just simplify that, okay, this is the reason why one simple factor or two sectors, two factors. I don't think we can just sim simplify it like that. I think it should be more than that. As you said, okay, the lack of infrastructure is there and people are really ha have no choice but to just share everything. They cannot even practice the social distancing because they live door to door. So uh, how are we going to change their living habit and their environment, which is not possible overnight? And when it comes well, to make, the making, as you said, yeah. Yeah, Phil? Yeah, I would suggest this, that... Uh that Bill Gates, who's worked a lot there with his uh, foundation, uh, first he attacked the problem of malaria, you know, so that would save lives. His biggest interest now has been sanitation. And he actually worked hard to invent a toilet that is feasible to have available to more and more people. So he intuited that, that the, 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 the sharing, there's still going to be some sharing, but that that's spreading the disease when you don't have good toilets. Uh, but let me ask you more uh, another question. We can uh, uh, 
I don't want to stop the discussion about what to do in India, but going back to, and that came from a question that was asked, but aren't we uh, still, we, we started by showing how uh, the two things, inequality for women and climate are related. Are we going on to other inequalities? Are we trying to use the time to map the next inequality, the inequality between nations or the inequality between uh, the rich and the poor or something? I don't know. Yeah, so that's exactly what we're doing, Phil. We're, we're going to go over these, you know, eight or nine types of inequality and how okay. they affect us at an individual, community, work, okay. uh, state, and national levels. Should we and move on to the next yeah. one? Or well, do you, well, we haven't done it yet. We're going to spend the next get, month uh, doing it. What? We're going to spend the next month doing that. Oh, oh! I thought during this yeah. show we wanted to touch on each one. Because no, we're, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah what, we're, yeah, what we're doing, Phil, is we're trying to kick off the the second round, uh, and that second round is inequality, and and so Carthy and and Arissa kind of jumped the gun because they were looking. They started off with climate change, but then said let's let's include uh, gender inequality, which is the next topic, inequality, and see how those intersect. So that's why we brought them in because they actually have already done some work and seeing these interconnections. And so we're gonna use that kind of thinking to do the next ones, to show okay. the connections, let's say, between poverty and, and just as, as, a, as a driver. Of course, women are more impacted by poverty as, as uh, Arissa and Karthi were showing. But, uh, you know, and, and, and then again, this is not, of course, just about India. Because if you look at uh, just the workplace itself, and the inequality in the workplace between, let's say, the average worker and the CEO pay, you see yeah. such a wide gap. And Phil and I actually wrote an article on this a while back on the billionaires and that how it would take, uh, you know, something like, uh, what was it, a thousand years to make the money for the average guy to, to make what his CEO made in, in a year. So just imagine that. You would have to work for 800 years to make what your CEO made this year. Yeah. That's just- well, for, for background, uh, for background, uh, when um, this problem was analyzed by Peter Drucker, he said, you know, it seems to me that a CEO should be better paid, but 20 times the median earnings, 20. Then it got up to a hundred. I think in Japan, it's still more reasonable, like a hundred, 150 times. In the United States, it's 320 times higher the salary of the take-home pay of the uh, leader. So here's the thing. Um, we tried to handle that by requiring companies in the United States to report the, the CEO's pay as, with, you know, 320x, hoping if we had unions, if we had unions, the unions would go after that guy and say, how can you stop paying us more when you get so much money to take home, and not only you, but all the senior managers. So the point uh, is that uh, when we find the, the inequality there, we've got to shame it. This is called brand shaming. Don't buy from a company that does that kind of pay level to its boss, or put a, a law out that the boss can't get more than 100 times the worker. Phil, what you're talking about is also a structural problem. So, you know, recently there was a story, and I, I like to bring this up because I think it il illustrates some of this. In British soccer, just last week and a week, the week before, we had some of the top clubs deciding that they were going to join together with some Italian clubs and some Spanish clubs and create their own Super League, which was modeled after like the NBA which is a mon monopolistic sport league where it basically says that some of the top teams get together and basically take, you know, the lion's share of the wealth and everybody else is sort of left out of the, the story. Mm -hmm. Now, this was, of course, uh, a speculative move which was funded by or backed, bankrolled by J.P. Morgan Chase and, mm -hmm. and uh the guy who was at Manchester United was actually used to work for JP Morgan Chase and he's, he's since resigned. 
But what we saw there is when the companies tried to do that, the fans just revolted, revolted. They just came out into the streets and said, that's not going to happen. We're not going to let this happen. The players revolted, the managers, the coaches revolted. And, and the reason is because soccer is a part of the community. Now, what was very interesting in this structural conflict was that the teams in Germany, Phil, didn't even, didn't even say they were going to do this. They were like, we're not doing this. And you know what the reason was? Because they have a rule called 51 plus that says that 51% of the team is owned not by investors, but by local, uh, by members of the club. And they have to be local. So in these other companies, uh, other teams like Manchester United, it's owned by an uh, uh, American billionaire who basically is viewing this as an asset that he can buy and sell and do whatever he wants to make money with. Whereas in, in Germany, it's part of the community and it's not allowed. You can't just move it. You know, you can't just buy and sell it because you have to have the consent of 51% uh, majority of, of the community. That same law, as you know, Phil, is part of German management in business, which says that uh, the board has to have at least one member who is an employee. If that was, if that happened for American business, we would see a lot of things differently because mm -hmm. it would not be hijacked in this way that makes it much more unequal and divorces it from the community and from the customers that it serves. And I think that's that's one of the big lessons that we're seeing for coming out of the soccer fiasco that just happened. But it actually has a spillover effect because even Boris Johnson, who you know is not a liberal, he's not a you know community loving kind of guy, but even he said he was ready to write laws that would not permit that to happen. So here you have a government saying we will write laws that will not allow this league a soccer league to be broken up imagine if they did that for business imagine it i mean it took them one day to fight this and destroy that plan whereas here we are fighting for 20 30 40 50 years and nothing's really happened with the environment so we need that same kind of soccer passion for the for the planet and and, uh, and and that's I guess that's how we should end this thing. I, I think we've had uh, probably gone on long enough. But if anybody has any questions, now's your chance, and then and then we'll just say bye. And we invite you, wicked7.org, come join us and work on this inequality stuff. We'll be mapping uh, inequality in all its forms all this month. Yeah, so let me oh, here's a good a question. <clears throat> We went through uh, a wonderful presentation on how a, a gender inequality is caused and, and, and created by climate change. Are you saying that uh, two or three other volunteers will make work on any of the other problems? And uh, do you have a, uh, can, how do we let people who want to be working on these problems know the five maybe problems of inequality, what they are, and then write for, can I work on that with X or right. Y? Right, Phil, if you if you go to the Wicked 7 site, there's a click, you cl click on the participate button, and we, okay. we actually have, we have a guidelines for income inequality, where we ask you to get involved, and we walk you step by step. One of our members has actually built a video showing you how you start mapping this stuff. Uh, it's, it's actually there at the bottom of the page on the participate page. Uh, Nicholas, Very good. Uh, here it is, Nicholas's video that he did uh, last week uh, or a few days ago on really showing you how to map and, and the process that you can use to start thinking about this. So it's actually really well done and, and, and it does give you uh, some insight into how this this wicked system thinking business uh, actually works. And Let me ask you: If I wanted to put my own map out on some particular problem, how do I get to use those arrows and those lines? In right, my, I'm used to linear work, and I I wondered if you would explain to the group how we put together these little things and connect them. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what this video does. It, it talks about okay. that. So we'll show you. We'll show you the video, but but you're right. I mean, we actually have a process that says you can actually map these out as cause and effect, and then yes. later on, uh, and then we have a template that you can use to start drawing these charts. That's and, what I was looking for. Right, and we're saying that if you do, you have this template and you have a Google Docs template, so there's two types of templates. And then, of course, we give you the option to use the old-fashioned template, just a pen and pencil, and just sketch this out. And you're we're happy to take that as well. So if you have to do it in paper and pen and pencil, nothing wrong with that. We, you know, as long as you have some uh, research to back up your points. So this is the other thing that we are doing, Phil. Every link there that you click on will have a resource or some kind of report or article explaining why we came with, up with this conclusion. Oh, good, good. So Arissa's map that Carthy and Arissa have done, that Carthy was working on, on gender inequality and climate change. If you pull that up for a second, Carthy, why don't you show Phil that you can click on one of those links and it'll take you to the article that actually explains that link. That's what's so neat about this, Phil, is we're trying to build a repository of, of these diagrams. The but there's, yeah. yeah, but the, all the sources are, are, are backing this up. And here's right. the thing. We don't just want one source. We want several sources. Sure. So, yeah, and we want even competing sources that are maybe not agreeing with each other so we can debate those things. So that's yeah. part of what this project is about. And again, you know, it's a learning project. We really don't know what we're really doing, but so what we're doing is learning. So what's amazing is Susie did a chart on plastics. Uh, Karthi, you want to bring that up for a second, just off the website? Look at this chart, Phil. And, and then we'll, we do, we did have one question here uh, talking about is cultural change important, uh, and is that you know sort of one of the first things we need to do, and. You know, if you look at the studies of systems change and you look at systems, there are so many problems that the most important problem, and this goes back to uh, Thomas Kuhn and the, the scientific revolutions. You know, the idea is of paradigm shifts, that you do have to change the mindset, which in a sense is the culture of your thinking, to be able to even see these new ways of thinking. So let's zoom into that uh, right here, Phil. I don't know if you can make that any bigger. I, I, is that possible? Phil, this was the problem of plastics in the ocean. Yes, yes, I see. And, and okay. what Susie did, did was the same thing. She jumped in and went into microplastics, you know, what were the airborne plastic pollution, you know, when you incinerate these things, because one of the, how do you solve the problem, pl uh, plastic problem? You throw it into an incinerator and burn it. Well, what happens next? You're producing toxic fumes, and on top of that, you're just putting plastic pollution up into the sky. Yeah, yeah, or in the water. Su Susie, you want to say, talk about your chart a little bit here? Um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it just it was interesting to find out more about it and how it's actually interconnected all of it and where it comes from so that the whole problem is actually also deeply connected to the fossil fuel industry which is now trying to invest heavily into plastics because it's seeing that that's an area where they can make profits from. But it goes further that there's actually, there are systematic problems along the whole value chain because companies can produce the plastics, but they don't really have any kind of responsibility as to what happens at the end of life. So that creates like a problem, a global problem, because high income countries also tend to ship off their plastic waste to low income countries who definitely don't have the infrastructure to deal with those amounts of plastic. Um, and that leads to things being openly dumped or inappropriately recycled or to massive landfilling. So, mm. and that again, um, leads to the whole plastification of the planet, which essentially pollutes everything, the air, the water, the soil, and the rivers. I, I read somewhere that even, go ahead, Phil. No, I, I'm just, I didn't know about this being done because 
I do know of uh, companies starting to you know, worry about it and what can they do to replace plastics and so on. But uh, this chart is very exciting. Thank you for doing that. You know, Susie, Phil, what's really you. amazing is that what Susie just said is that the, the strategy for the oil and fuel, fossil fuel companies to get out of carbon, to decarbon, is to basically up their plastics by 40%. Getting out of uh, carbon is going to increase the amount of plastics? No. Or what, what they're trying to do is they're saying, okay, we'll burn less fossil fuels. We'll get out of yeah. coal, let's say. We'll divest okay. from some of these things. We'll reduce our carbon footprint. But all that energy that we take is, and, and instead of making a burning fuel, we're going to convert it into plastic. I so see. their strategy Ooh. is, you know, we're going to take one form of pollution greenhouse gases and, and do another trade one, off. trade off for plastics. And plastics is already a disaster. And not only that, but once it becomes this micro nanoparticles, Susie, tell us what happens with the water. Yeah, it ends up in the water. And actually I read a study that on average, one can assume that every person eats like a credit card a week. That's like what we take in through um, the things we consume. Um, that's just like, obviously, if you consume a lot of fish or products where they end up in in animals, um, that it ends up in your body. Yes, but it's quite shocking. Even though on my map, I, I basically focused on the impact on nature. It hasn't even touched on the impact it has on like the economy. It has on tourism. It has social impact. This is just the impact on on nature. But of course, the impact on humans is a lot bigger or even more devastating. Uh, maybe can I have some word? <clears throat> uh, yeah, actually, uh, I think uh, this kind of problem, we really have to look at the, the cycle of the product, like a product cycle, because if we start from designing, like uh, using the wrong material, like a plastic from the beginning, Recycling wouldn't work, as you know. So we really have to go to the, the first part, the first phase of the producing the products. So what material are we going to use? As somebody left a question before, I think it was more like a comment in the live chat, that innovation is the key, one of the keys to addressing these kind of problems because we need some material can, which can replace the uh, plastic, which is more like eco-friendly. So when we look at the recycling, because from the beginning, it's already wrong material. The design itself is already wrong. And then we try to recycle them, which wouldn't work. So I, I really hope that suggests that um, people can think about how we are going to design and use the wrong, uh, the right products, the materials, so that we can successfully um, make it more eco-friendly. But at the moment, no matter how many times we recycle, as you know, it doesn't work because the material itself is really wrong from the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. In, in fact, there's, study, there's a study that said that the, the fossil fuel industry was trying to convince us for the last 20 years that plastics are recyclable when they really aren't. Or, like, or that coal could be clean coal. Right, when it really can't, right. Another thing, Phil, if you if we want to save the planet, there are three things we need to do right away. Stop eating beef, mm. stop eating soy, uh, soy and, and palm oil, because those three things are destroying the Amazon and turning it from a carbon sink into a carbon uh, emitter. Yes, absolutely, Jessica. That's a great point. We do need to take these broader wicked problems, break them down into smaller wicked problems. And that's what we're trying to do. Uh, if you look at what uh, some of our charts have been about, and again, you know, uh, we're sort of all over the map, no pun intended, you know, we're, but what we're trying to do is learn. We're gonna have regional maps, we're gonna have local maps, we're gonna have sort of this global kind of thinking map. We're going to have maps that are very focused on areas like, like this India. Uh, I think I'm working with somebody, a highly respected person in India uh, who runs a think tank over there, has asked us to work with them to create a COVID map 
that maps out the issues uh, specifically in, in India. So we're going to try to do that again in a way that's not political, that's not pointing fingers and blaming, but trying to see, okay, what is it that we have to do to right so that we don't have this problem? So part of this uh, idea is we're not trying to be negative. We're just trying to solve the problem. To solve the problem, you have to know what it is. And that's, I think, where people who say, ah, you guys are too negative are really missing the point. You can't even start to solve the problem if you don't understand how it impacts, uh, how these impacts happen. So that's really what this project's about, as you know, Phil. And our first step is mapping. Then we're going to go to, okay, how do we find those leverage points in these huge maps that could make a real difference? Uh, and like one of the things I said, just stop eating beef and you'll make a huge difference. All right, I think I think we're done, Phil. We've taken up your time. I want to apologize to the people for messing up at the beginning there, because uh, you know I, I just didn't have a clue what I was doing well, with the technology. When we go again, when we go again uh, on the next iteration, the same problem will come up. So we'll try to do it we'll a little practice, differently. We'll practice, Phil. We'll practice. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I know by advancing the up arrow or the down arrow, it works. Okay. That's right. That's right. We got it. That was a wicked problem we just solved today, Phil. So, thanks everyone. And remember, if you have any everyone, you've you've done a wonderful Thank job. You. Thanks everybody. Thanks Carthy. Thanks Arissa. Thanks Susie. Th Thank thanks you. everybody. Thanks Laura. And one more thing: if you do have any questions, feel free to come to our site and contact us through our site, or join us. You know, sign up and be part of this thing. Thanks so much, guys. Take care. Thanks, Carthy. Thank it's, you. It's like. Three in the morning for Kathy in Colombo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Oh, yeah. Good night. Good night. Thanks.